Well, so the month and could if I'll say so I'm going to speak in English the rest of the time. Uh, so I, my name is Matthew Weiro Finney. The whole thing oh that is my full last name, Weir O'Finney. Uh, Weird married thing. I have been working on Zend Framework since 2006, January of 2006, uh, and at Zend since September of 2005. Um, full time on Zend Framework since uh, the end of 2007. So I've got a bit of a unique perspective. Uh, the last couple of years, we've been working on Zend Framework 2, which we released uh, two, two months ago. Yeah. Uh, oh no, almost three months ago. <laughs> Time is flying right, uh, right about now. I'm very happy to be here in Nantes. I, typically, I can't come to PHP Tour because we have uh, Thanksgiving holidays. And so this year, they were um, a week early, so I was able to come. It's a beautiful city, so thanks for having me. I'm going to go over basically core concepts. I'm not going to show you too much about programming in Zen Framework. But I'm going to show you how it works, so that if you can understand how it works, you can maybe use it. The main concepts within Zen Framework 2 are events. And this is how you do things. And this is how the application executes the various pieces that need to happen. We have services, and that's the objects that are being acted upon within the workflow. And then we have modules, which are how you wire services into the workflow. We're going to look at each of these. The first is the event manager. How many of you have done JavaScript? Lots of us, yeah. We, under, we know what events are, right? Uh, how many of you have used uh, Doctrine or Symphony? Okay. How about Lithium? No, nobody. <laughs> uh, the event manager that we have in Zen Framework 2 is trying to fulfill many different um, design patterns. Subject observer, it's looking at signal slots. Uh, we have an implementation that's actually more akin to signal slots than events. Uh, standard event management, uh, meant aspect-oriented programming techniques. And we're trying to fulfill all of these. You're not going to see all of that today because I just want you to understand the basics. The first are events. An object will trigger an event. So this will be the target and it will say trigger this. And then other objects will listen to it. So we're all familiar with this. How do we, in JavaScript, we'll say something like on, uh, on mouse click or something like that, and we'll wire a listener, an event handler to that. It gets past an event. It does something with it. It's the same thing in PHP, except for we don't have asynchronous processing. So it will be linear. So the terminology we use within Zen Framework 2 is that an event is a named action, but it's also a value object. We pass around an event object to every listener. The listener is a callback that accepts an event and acts on it. The listener can be any PHP callback. So that means you can use a static method, you can use a function, you can use um, an instance method if you want to, you can use an invocable class, Anything that uh, can be evaluated as a PHP callable can be used as a listener. The event manager aggregates all these listeners for each event. And you will have an event manager per object that needs to trigger some sort of event. We have a concept of shared listeners as well. I'm not going to go into that today, but uh, you, shared listeners are basically ones that are queried by each event manager instance so that you can have very fine-grained or very loose and uh, abstract listeners that are listening to all sorts of events. So as an example of a listener, this, uh, this example shows a, a bunch of different things. We'll pretend that we have some object, and it will compose an event manager. The standard way that we do this is um, there's an interface that we use uh, so that you can compose an event manager. And when you do that, you have a method called getEventManager. We're very literal. <laughs> We then attach to that, we attach to a specific named event, and we give a callback. I'm using a closure here because it's easy. I can fit it on a slide. I don't need to do a class declaration. It gets that event object passed to it as an argument. That uh, object always has a name, a target, the target being whatever object is triggering the event, 
and parameters. You can also have specialized event objects, and we have several within Zen Framework, too. Uh, examples are the MVC event or the view event, where you have additional behavior or values that are uh, aggregated. But you always have a get params method as well. Once we do that, we can take that information back out and do something with it and act upon it. This is a simple example of a logger of some sort that you might want to do, but it's just to show what we can do there. So this is a listener. We're attaching to an event. How do we trigger an event? So here is a public method on a, a class, some object, and we're getting in a couple of arguments to it. The recommendation we have is that when you trigger, you use the function name, just the function name. So this will be do. Um, that would be shorter to do than function here, but it's giving you the idea. The other thing is that any parameter that you pass to the method you want to also pass to the event. So I'm using compact here. You might use other means. Once we do that, we can simply say, uh, grab the event manager, and we say trigger. And we're done. There are a variety of different ways you might do this. It might be that that's all you do within your particular method. You may do stuff both before and after, in which case you'll want to trigger multiple times. Um, it's however you want to use it, basically. Now, the implications of this are that if I trigger this, you know, if I call this do method with a couple of arguments, that listener that I just attached is going to echo out something like this. So that's the event manager. There are a lot of other features to it. That's just a simple basic usage. There are many other uh, features. I talked about shared listeners a few minutes ago. These are useful because you may want to attach a listener to a particular controller but you don't know if that controller will actually be selected this particular time. So I can attach a listener without having an actual instance of the controller. I can also say that I want to attach uh, an instance to many different uh, controllers or many different uh, objects, and so I can do that through shared listeners. Uh, usually we will do that with uh, interface names. We also have a concept of priority. I mentioned before that uh, we're synchronous. Uh, it's PHP. We don't have any synchronous processes, which means that we can actually kind of play with the order in which the listeners are done. Uh, so we have priority. We use uh, PHP's SPL priority queue uh, internally, which means that anything with a high integer will execute first. Default is uh, one, and then any negative integers will execute last. So this replaces, for those of you using Zen Framework 1, we don't need to have pre and post hooks. We can trigger a single event, and your listeners can say, I'm going to listen at high priority or low priority in order to trigger before or after. So it's a very nice thing to do. You can also stop propagation within a listener. So the listener can do, just like in JavaScript, you can say stop propagation, and no other listeners will trigger, right? We can do the same thing uh, within Zen Framework 2. Uh, additionally, you can, when you trigger, specify a callback that will introspect the result, and you can act on the result. And if you return a particular uh, value out of that, it will stop propagation as well. We do that within the framework, within the MVC. When any given listener returns a response object, we're done. So we can bubble out, stop propagation, and end the request. Uh, additionally, uh, as I mentioned before, because we're able to... Um, introspect the results coming in, you are always returned an aggregate of all the results. And so you can loop over those. Uh, you can get the first, the last. You can filter for certain types of objects and that sort of thing. We're probably going to do a lot more around that. Um, a couple of different people have ideas from other uh, languages that they would like to implement there. But it's a, it's a tremendously powerful component and yet ultimately very simple, as we saw in the first examples. So that's events. Any questions on that? Feel free to ask questions whenever. Just raise your hand, and I'll go, Ooh, okay. If you ask a good question, I'll throw you a USB stick. So <laughs> I'm trying to give incentive here. So that's the event manager. I mentioned there were, there were three core concepts, and that's one of them. The next one is services. So we have a service manager. The idea of the service manager stems from Zen Framework 1. How many of you use Zen Framework 1 here? Okay, a lot of you. Okay. Somebody answer this. How do you get a dependency into your controller in Zen Framework 1? What's that? 
Yeah, okay, that's one. <laughs> Anybody else? Other ways? He, re- he said the registry. What else? Oh, come on, nobody uses, yeah? Yeah, the bootstrap. Okay, that's another way. Uh, any other ideas? There's more than one way, isn't there? It's a problem. So the whole idea with the service manager was trying to answer the question of how do I get dependencies into my controllers? And uh, I've seen there's some talks uh, today about solid principles and things like that. So hopefully you're getting all of that information and you know about dependency injection at this point. So we started looking at it and we said we need to do inversion of control. We came up with two solutions. I'm not going to talk about the first one today because we ultimately deprecated it. But the second is the service manager. Services are basically any object you're going to work with and that you want to reuse within your application. So this includes controllers. Your controller is a service. If any of you are using Symfony 2, it's, you guys have the same idea. Controllers are services. This is a tremendously powerful concept because it means I can pull this out of the service container and have all my dependencies right there. It means I can substitute... I have a... I misspelled... I can substitute any service, which means if I have defined a service within my container and I later want to change it, I can do so. I actually did this very recently where I found a bug in another uh, module I was using, and I needed to replace it. Well, instead of going and monkey patching or something like that, I went and created uh, an extension to the class, overrode the method, and then told the service container, use my class and not his and I was able to work around it until my patch went upstream. This is a a very powerful uh, concept here. You can define how you want them built. And that's something that you couldn't do in Zen Framework 1. Your controller was instantiated and you just worked with it. That was it. Zen Framework 2, I can actually say I need to instantiate it with these particular constructor dependencies, and then I need to have these other dependencies I'm going to pull out and use setters. I can do any sort of initialization I want within my factory. It's a fantastic thing. The main thing, though, is I want you to think about the service manager as a way to implement inversion of control. Don't use it as a service locator that you pass to your controllers and pull stuff out of. Use it as a way to get the stuff in there in the first place. And I'll show you an example shortly. We have many types of services, and I'm going to show you an example of each of these. Instances, where you already have the instance and you want to just share it. Constructorless classes, so classes that you can simply instantiate. You don't need to pass anything to them. Those are called invocables. We have factories, when an object may have dependencies or some sort of initialization you need to do. Abstract factories, where you have related objects that have similar construction patterns, so these might be plugins or adapters or something like that. You can alias services to other services and also alias aliases to services. We'll see that in a minute. And you can do automated initialization. And I'm going to show you an example of this. This is one of the most powerful features of the service manager. So first are instances. Every part of the service manager, there's multiple ways to influence it. You can do everything programmatically in an object-oriented fashion, or you can use configuration as well. Uh, and I'm showing you the configuration keys. I'm using arrays here. You can use INI, you can use XML, JSON, YAML, any of those. I show arrays here because we're PHP developers, right? So, um, so an instance, I simply set the instance in, I give it a name. And uh, the configuration key is services, and we just have the class name, uh, not the class name, the service name pointing to the instance. Very easy. Invocables are similarly easy. Um, And I have this one wrong. Yep. Copy-paste problem. So the invocable class, I would actually put a string name of the uh, the foo class. So I would say simply foo. And for the configuration, the configuration key is invocables here. Um, Again, these are ones where you simply do not have any constructor dependencies. What's cool is that through initializers later, I can go and do a dependency injection on these and still define them in this way, uh, which is fantastic. Now, factories are when you want to do a little bit more. You set factory, and you give it a callable or a factory. So any PHP callable will work. You can give a string name of a class that implements the factory interface that we define, or as long as that class has the magic underscore underscore invoke method, 
it will also use that. So it will say, oh, that's a callable. This is great. So you can use either of those. Now for the factory um, configuration, you use factories. And you can use closures if you want to, because they're another type of callable. And I did that here just to show how, what you might be doing. A service manager passes itself to the factory, and that way you can actually pull other services out, which is a really nice thing to do. So here I've got a dependency. I grab it out of the service container, and then I pass it to the constructor of the foo object, and now I return that instance, and it's all set up for me. Um, as you can see, I've got a couple of different ways of showing how you might do um, other types of callables in there. Abstract factories are when you've got a group of objects that have a similar construction. And in this case, there's not a one-to-one -one relationship between the service name and the, uh, the actual instance that it's going to be returned. You'll have many service names that can be returned by, uh, that will return instances out of this. So in this case, we have to always implement the abstract factory inter interface. And this is within the Zen service manager um, namespace. That interface defines two methods. One is a method saying, can I actually create the service that you're requesting? And the second one is create it. You can assume that if create service name has been called, that uh, the can create service name with name um, has passed true at this point. The reason for this is that you can have multiple abstract factories. And so one abstract factory might handle one type of class Another would do others. We actually have one for Zend DI, which I promised not to talk about, but I will now. This was uh, an automated DI um, container that we had that uses reflection and uh, other means in order to basically magically resolve your dependencies for you. We have an abstract factory with DI, and if you have this enabled, if you request a class that uh, it, you know, nobody else can resolve, if it's a class name, the DI factory can probably resolve it and we'll try to return an instance for you. So there's some really cool things with this as well. Next are aliases. So in this case, I want to say, when I request my foo, return the foo service instead. Or using configuration, the aliases key, I can do that. Or I could say foo master and alias that to my foo, and then that will resolve to the foo service. So I can actually alias aliases. Uh, and these can be nested. There is circular uh, dependency resolution so that we don't uh, get an infinite lookup going on. Uh, but yeah, this is a really nice thing. We use this quite a lot in modules, and I'm going to talk about modules more. But the idea is that once I have, um, I can define an alias and I can say, this is a common service that I'm going to be wanting to use for my module, but I'll define an alias to that common service so that if I want to override that service, um, I can do that. A good example might be that there might be a database adapter that's common throughout the application. But maybe on this particular module, I want to go to a different database. And so I can alias it then to a different service, which is really nice. And now my favorite feature of the service manager are initializers. Like abstract factories, these are going to be simply callbacks of some sort or something uh, implementing the initializer interface. So you do these as an array. There's no one-to-one -one pairing. You just initialize these. It will, for each instance that is created by the service manager, the first time it creates the instance, because it's shared by default, it will then pass the instance to each initializer. And so these are done in order. Now, what does an initializer look like? It looks like this. So it gets past the instance and the service container. So the typical idea that you do here is you check to see if an instance implements a particular interface. And if it does, you inject it. So you can automate a lot of things this way. This is how we um, automate getting the event manager into objects that um, implement the event manager aware interface. Um, if you want to use the service manager as a service locator, um, you will implement the service locator aware interface and this will get passed in. Uh, there are a variety of others as well. And you'll find that a lot of modules define initializers for the classes that they define. This is a great feature because it means that I can have very small amounts of configuration for my classes. I can define them as invocables and then still get all the dependencies I need right up front. We have a lot of other features as well. In order to keep the framework consistent, we made all plugin managers a type of service manager. 
Uh, what happens is that if the plugin manager is managed by the main service manager, they get injected with that instance as well. But that means that you can now create widgets very easily. In the past, if you wanted to create a widget in Zen Framework 1, what sorts of weird things did you do? <laughs> Anybody? Come on. Okay, so maybe you use the action helper or, yeah, okay, there's this one. You get one. <laughs> uh, there was the, you might do forward, right? And you would do a whole bunch of things uh, or use the action stack and that sort of thing. These were all anti-patterns. <laughs> it was awful. So by using the service manager as a basis for plugins, it means that our view helpers, for instance, can get dependencies injected in them, just like controllers. So... Let's say I want to have a recent news widget. I can create a view helper for that, have it injected with the model where it gets the news, and then I can just grab that view helper and use it within my view scripts, and I don't have to do anything special in my controllers or anything like that. This is view logic. I want this widget in there. It gets the stuff from the model it needs and, re and presents it. So it makes my, makes my code simpler, and it makes it easier to trace. Services are shared by default. You can actually tell it, do not share this instance. We have uh, one case where we do that by default, and that's the um, event manager. We want a discrete event manager instance for every single object that has, uh, composes one. And this is for certain granularity aspects that we wanted to address. Now, interestingly, that, each instance of that needs a shared instance of the shared listeners so that it can query those. So the event manager instance is not shared, but the shared event manager is, and so they each get the same instance of that. Another place where you would not want to share are things like filters and validators, and since they are managed as plugins, we can say do not share these by default so that each one can be a discrete instance. Um, but this can be enabled selectively per service if you want to, which is really nice. You can also do what's called peering managers, where you have different managers composed as parent-child relationships, and it will determine whether or not to pull a service out of the peering manager if I can't find it. I won't go into that because it's very advanced. <laughs> the other thing is that services are configurable. And we've got a variety of different ways. And what I'm showing here is the order of precedence. Um, so application configuration will define your base level of services. Then you'll have your module classes. We'll get to those in a minute. The module configuration, and then you can also have global and local override configuration. So I can change all of this and substitute at any stage in here, and it will, you know, as we go down, it will override whatever was above it. And this is one of the most powerful parts of the service manager, as far as I'm concerned. So we've been talking about events and services, and I said, you know, these are the core aspects. So now we can finally get to the MVC layer, because we understand these things. In the MVC layer, everything is an event. And these are just three that I selected in here. There were, there's actually a couple more uh, events. But it's important to look at it this way. The application steps through a workflow. And each one of those items on the workflow is simply an event that gets triggered. And there are listeners then for each one. So as we trigger that, all of the different listeners will get triggered and then we move on to the next one. Or if a response is returned at any time, we bubble up and we leave. We're done. I found that this is probably the easiest way to understand Zen Framework right here, Zen Framework 2. We have default listeners for most of the uh, events that we have. So as an example, uh, except for Bootstrap, Bootstrap's not one of those, but Route, we have a Route listener, and that does uh, aggregates the router that we use, and we'll go and try and route everything. Default listeners are typically listening on the default priority of one. And so what will happen is that will get triggered. If you want to alter the workflow in any way, you can register other listeners, and they can have higher or lower priorities so that we can act either on what happened or what will happen for that particular event. So you can do some really cool things. As an example, I will put in a route listener at negative priority, so now I know that I've already matched a route, and I can take a look at that route and I can say, okay, this route requires authentication. And then I can take a look at my authentication service and say, do I have an identity? Oh, I don't. I'm going to return a 401 response and be done. And I don't have to execute anything else. I don't have to pull a controller out. 
I've made a very lean request at this point. So I can do that at uh, various levels throughout here. So the MVC is a bunch of events. The events that the MVC uh, layer does, the application class itself uh, defines are the bootstrap event. So at this point, all modules, all, and we'll talk about modules in a minute, <laughs> uh, everything has been configured, and we know that we've got everything we need for the application to execute. And so we'll trigger a bootstrap event. And at this point, you can have listeners that will do further initialization. They might wire additional listeners, that sort of thing. We have the route event, which is when we try and match the request to a particular controller. There's a dispatch event, which is when we actually try and dispatch the controller. And if at any point during uh, actually either routing or dispatch, there's an error of some sort, we do a dispatch error event. And that basically will raise up, you know, a uh, uh, a 404 or a 500 uh, HTTP status at that point and give a, a specific layout. There's the render event, and so this is when we actually render the view. Notice we're not rendering as part of the controller. It is simply uh, an event that gets triggered. And at that point, we do something. In 2.1, we're also introducing a render error similar to dispatch, so that if there is an exception that occurs during rendering, you don't get a white screen <laughs> with nothing, uh, which is not very fun. And then finally, the finish event, which is when we actually send the response. So if at any point a response is returned, we skip over all the other events and go to finish, and we're done. Uh, another thing to note is that this is what the default application instance does. There's nothing saying that you have to use Zend MVC application. You can define your own application object if you want with its own workflow. And then you wire your own events and everything. So we've given you a lot of building blocks to build whatever application you want to do, basically. So next part is routing. So the MVC defines these events, and these are triggered. We have the route event. So routing is simply matching request to the controller. The request can be, you can match any part of the request. If you want to do the schema, the host name, the port, the URI, uh, if you want to do the query string or the HTTP method, you can act on any of that. The only requirement is that once you match, you return a controller name so that we can actually pull that controller out of there. In Zen, uh, Zen Framework 1, we had both controller and what else? What were the requirements? When we did routing, you had to have a controller and module sometimes. What else? Action. You already got, a, you already got one. <laughs> In Zen Framework 2, you don't need an action. It just needs to go to a controller because a controller simply implements uh, an, a really simple interface called dispatchable interface. It only needs a single method, and it's called dispatch. By default, we have two different controllers, a, um, an action controller and a RESTful controller. Uh, these are both abstract. And those act similar to what we had in Zen Framework 1. But you can define your own controllers. And as long as your dispatch method can handle it, it doesn't matter what you put in there. So you don't actually need an action now, which is, uh, I find it rather liberating. Um, as an example, I have a lot of page controllers. And so instead of defining an action, I'll define a page in my routing. And from there, I'll go and see, do I have a template that matches this? And if so, I'll render. In terms of routing, we have a number of route types. And these are just, it's just a sampling of them. You have literal routes, um, segment, and segments are similar to what we had in Zen Framework 1. The difference uh, is a little bit in the notation. We're using now the, uh, the colon notation uh, that a lot of uh, frameworks are now using. I believe Rails started it. Um, but you can also use bra uh, braces in order, no, brackets, sorry, uh, in order to denote optional portions, which is really neat. Re uh, regular expression routes, everybody knows those. Scheme, method, wildcard. One of the important things about our routes, though, uh, that I'm not showing here is that they're defined as a tree structure. And so you can define a literal route as the, the root of your uh, particular module and then have child roots on it. And so you have the literal route. It will match to a particular controller. It makes the configuration a little... Uh, you don't have to configure the controller for every single one. But then you can have these child roots to match different segments. It makes the matching much faster because we can use a B-tree algorithm internally. Um, but it also makes it more flexible because I can then say, I want to change the, the string that this 
matches on. So for instance, a module might define the string as uh, something like contact. Well, I want it to be contact us. Because that might be the root, the, the parent root of this particular module, I can go in and change the configuration for just that part, and it will now affect all the children as well. So it's very flexible. Now, a root is going to map to a particular controller. So let's take a look at controllers. As I said before, controllers are services. I don't want you relying on the fact that the service manager is passed. I want you to take the, uh, use the power of the service manager in order to uh, inject your dependencies. They look pretty much like Zen Framework 1. So I've got this abstract action controller that I'm extending. Um, because this is an action controller, I define action methods within there. So I've got a, a world action. The big difference is that I don't assign things to the view. There's no view object composed. Instead, my controllers, my methods in the controllers simply return something. Usually that will be a view model or something that will be converted into a view model at some point. It's the stuff that I want to pass to the view is what it comes down to. So this is one of the big differences. The reason for this, it makes your controllers testable because I want you guys testing your code. Who, you, who does unit testing? Oh, good. We need more people doing unit testing. Um, it makes it easy to unit test because I can now simply be, uh, push a request and everything into my uh, object, and then I can execute the method and do my assertions on what's returned. Very easy. I can actually unit test. I don't have to integration test. Um, you'll also notice that I'm, I'm not using the front controller or bootstrap object. And the reason being that I'm going to inject my dependencies. Yeah? Can you go back? Yeah. Yeah, you can say get request, get response. Yeah. Um, not by default. It's not an argument of it. However, because you can implement your own controllers, you can actually do that sort of thing. That was one of the, um, a common request actually, was that people wanted to be able to take the, uh, like the route arguments or something and pass them as, uh, directly as arguments to the methods, right? Um, you can do that if you implement your own controllers uh, because all you have to do is implement that dispatch method and then you work out the logic for how that works. So, uh, by default, with the controllers that we provide, you can get at the request object, the response object, uh, the route matches, uh, and everything in the MVC event as well that is passed in there. So. so if you need dependencies, if you need to operate on other objects within your controllers, define a setter. So I've got a dependency, I have a setter for set dependency, and in my world action, I may oper you know, operate on that particular dependency. To get that in there, I'm simply gonna define a factory because Controllers are managed by a factory within your service manager. And so the way this works is uh, the controller manager is a form of plugin manager. And so it gets passed to the controller manager, which is its own service manager, that has access to the master service manager. So we call get service locator and can get that. And from there I can get my dependency, instantiate my controller, set the dependency, and return it. So it's very declarative. You have it in one place. It's easy to debug. I like debugging when I can do it easily. <laughs> and so this is the, the way we can do it. But we've got this. Where do I define this factory? That's the next question, right? And that's where we come to modules. Modules in Zen Framework provide the MVC with the information it needs to work. So auto-loading, configuration, the services that you're going to define, including your controllers and your plugins. Any event listeners that you want to wire, you can do in your modules. Modules are intended to be plug and play. Has anybody ever successfully reused a module in Zen Framework 1? You have? No? Yes? I'm shocked. Because <laughs> it's incredibly hard. You were able to reuse it in multiple applications. Yeah, that's what, I, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> In Zen Framework 2, modules are reusable, and uh, that, that was the design. Now, an actual module in Zen Framework 2 is simply a PHP namespace, and uh, you usually have a class in that namespace called module, and that provides the features to the application. Now, module, not the class, a module can contain anything. 
It'll typically contain your PHP code, like your controllers and you know, everything that you're going to have for the MVC. Uh, view scripts will often be in there. You'll have uh, configuration, of course. Uh, you might have public assets that you want to bundle as part of the module, so images, CSS, that sort of thing. Really, they can have anything you want in there. It's up to you how you want to do it. Now, the modules do this. You can define them, but how do you actually integrate the modules with the MVC? And that's through the module manager. The module manager simply loops through the modules that you've defined and uh, activated within your uh, application, and then triggers an event for each module. So notice themes here, events, services, all over. Triggers an event, and then there are listeners that can in introspect the module class and figure out what features they expose. So the events are load modules, and this is not interesting. So we'll go on to this one. <laughs> uh, the main listeners that uh, you'll see most often are the autoloader listener. So if you have autoloading configuration for your module, you can define that and return it. A config listener, where you aggregate configuration from all of the modules. Service listener for doing the service manager. There's also individual plugin managers tie into this as well, into the service listener, allowing you to, to configure them as well. The on bootstrap listener is how you wire your module to listen to the bootstrap event. And there's a whole bunch more. Um, it seems like every minor release, we're probably going to add a few different ones because people are finding a whole bunch of use cases here. So what that means is a sample module class looks something like this. I've got my namespace my. My cl module class here is class module. I define get autoloader config. Uh, usually I'll be pointing uh, at the standard autoloader uh, at my source directory. Get config, I'll grab the configuration uh, file from my particular module. And then on Bootstrap, which receives an event object. And from there, I can pull out the application and wire other events. So getting started, you grab the skeleton. Yeah? Extend the module, extend more modules? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, there's a bunch of people doing this uh, at this point. So you grab the skeleton application. The easiest way is through Composer. You grab Composer. And you say composer.far, create project. You give it our repository URL because we have our own composer repository um, for a bunch of reasons. Um, and then you tell it to install the Zen Framework skeleton application. And you give it a, a path to install it at. And this will go and grab the skeleton application. And then it will run uh, and try and get Zen Framework for it and everything else that you need. Once you do that, you're going to search for some interesting modules. And so you'll go to modules.zenframework.com. And let's see if I can do this from here. Is my mouse over there yet? Yay. Minimal alt tab. Come on. Oh, control tab. There we go. So you go to modules.zenframework.com. And people can register their modules on here. And we show the most recent ones. Um, and you'll search for modules that are of interest to you. And then you will want to install them. So is that full screen again? Yay. <laughs> so at that point, you'll add modules to your configuration. And again, the easiest way is through Composer. So this is an example that goes through and adds a whole bunch of modules. So obviously, we want to tell it to use PHP and Zen Framework. This particular one, I'm also using Zen Service Recaptcha. Uh, so I can uh, do a recapture on one of my forms. I'm using uh, Fly Mongo, which is, gives me some um, uh, pagination and other things for Mongo uh, when I'm using it with Zen Framework 2. Uh, Fly Paste is a paste bin. And then I've also got SCN Social Auth so that I can authenticate users against any sort of social authentication uh, that you might imagine. So I do all of that. I configure the application. And I can go through and override in our config directory. We have these um, autoload bits. And I can go in and say, for this module, I want to add these options and override the defaults. And because this gets aggregated last, this wins, which is great. And then I tell my application about the modules I'm doing. So I've got uh, EDP Markdown is for a markdown library. FlyMongo, FlyPaste, SEN Social Auth which is also using ZFC base and ZFC user. So I can do the authentication. So I do all of those, and it's great. So I'm using a bunch of third-party modules. 
Now I might have some site-specific modules I need to do as well. And so I'll go and create some structure here and have a module PHP class, create a controller, have some configuration, have some view scripts. Very easy. We have a good tutorial for this, so I'm not going to go through it too much. Once I do all of that, however, I now have the ability to... There we go. I can now get an application with a lot, very little effort. Um, this pastebin application, uh, you can actually go to it, um, has social authentication. It's got pastebin, and the actual application itself has maybe 100 or 200 lines of code, and most of it is configuration because I was able to leverage all these other modules. That's the part that's exciting to me because I don't have to write authentication. That's boring. We've all done it a billion times. Um, I don't necessarily need to write a library for doing markdown. I can just simply consume somebody else's library for markdown. Um, I don't have to do the social authentication part. Somebody wrote a hybrid auth um, library that we now have a bridge to with the SEN social auth. I don't have to do that stuff. I can focus on the fun part of writing a website, which is the, the part that we all want to do. Yeah? Can I override module code? Yeah, very easily. In fact, uh, this was the, that particular site was the place that I, where I talked about earlier where I overrode a class in another module and redefined the service for that module to point to my class. That was it. <laughs> um, I don't have to anymore because my, stream, my patch got um, uh, pulled upstream, but I was able to do that. It's very easy at this point especially because we have the service manager, that the whole point of that is to be able to substitute. And so that's why we can use modules and then customize them. So a few miscellaneous things. First off, packaging options. Uh, Packages.zenframework.com has a whole bunch of different ones listed. They're also listed on framework.zen.com slash downloads. You can install via Composer, via Pyrus, via Git submodule. You can use tarballs and zipballs that we provide. You can install any given mo um, a component individually with its dependencies with uh, Composer and Pyrus, which is something we always wanted for Zen Framework 1 but never achieved. If you want to contribute, uh, framework.zen.com slash participate. Um, main thing, though, is know about the GitHub repository. We're very open. It's all transparent. All decisions are transparent. All review is transparent. It all is up on GitHub. You can comment on issues and on pull requests. You can create issue reports up there. If you're contributing, write tests, write documentation. You can do as little or as much as you want. We have people simply going through and correcting API docs at this point. Um, and it's great because it makes it better incrementally. Other ways to participate uh, on the IRC, we have a general uh, help channel, ZF Talk. Um, also, for if you're interested in helping develop the framework or you know, you're issuing pull requests and want to discuss them, zftalk.dev. On Stack Overflow, we have a couple of different tags specific to Zen Framework 2. Uh, the Zen Framework 2 tag, Zen Framework Modules, is another one for discussing individual modules. And of course, we have mailing lists. So that's about it. I know, uh, I think I'm coming up pretty late on time. Yeah, so, yeah, okay. So uh, I want to thank you. My Twitter handle is Wiro Finney, and uh, you can reach me also at the email address there. I'd appreciate any feedback from you as well. I joined in, so thank you. And if you have other questions, now is the time. Yeah? So, yeah speak up. Yes. Um, he's asking if he can benefit from composers auto-loading as well. Uh, absolutely. Uh, in fact, most of the time uh, with Composer, when you install a module via Composer, it's already setting up auto-loading for you. Uh, and you can hint to it to use a class map or to use uh, the PSR0 auto-loading. Um, in fact, that's how we're able to locate the module classes uh, from anything that you install via um, Composer, it actually finds it, uh, it's just auto-loadable, so it's able to find it. So yeah, absolutely you can. Uh, in fact, the, the framework, the skeleton application 
actually defines um, auto loading for all the module, uh, the application module that we ship by default. Um, it defines auto loading through PSR zero uh, and through Composer in there. Other questions? No, we're all hungry, right? So. Okay, j'ai faim. Let's, non, uh, on a encore un moment tout pour la meilleure question. Alors, yeah, il y en a oh, wait, yeah, you need one of these. You asked a question. <laughs> Best question. Oh, merci. <laughs> <rire> Pas de question okay. Alors à, à 3 heures, il y aura une euh, petite séance informelle sur ZF2 dans la salle 3 avec euh, Mathieu, vous pourrez faire des démos, euh, tout ce que vous voulez. Voilà. Bon appétit